So welcome to the February 28th Health and Ed Committee meeting. I have called it to order and our first item will be a roll call, please. Mr. Oliver. Present. Mr. Davidson. Here. Mr. Wilson. Here. Commissioner Boyd. Here. Commissioner McMurray. Commissioner Gooch. Last but not least is here. <laughs> Chairman Dodd. Present. Uh, we have a quorum. Com Commissioner McMurray has texted he's on eight four, uh, excuse me, on 04 Parkway at a standstill. So he's on the way. Yeah, let's elect him to something. <laughs> let's nominate him for something, Trey. And uh, I notice we have some commissioners uh, were here earlier. Paul Pettis was here. If any of you guys are interested in anything specific and you want to come up and join the back row of seats or up front, if it's of any benefit to you, please don't hesitate to join us. Vice Chair, let's, uh, we'll entertain the minutes from last month. Thank you, Chairman. I have reviewed the minutes from our January meeting, and I find them to be in order, and without objection, I would move for their approval. Is there a second or any second? Any discussion on that? All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Director Crumbie, you are number one again. Thank you, Chairman Dodd, uh, la ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Mr. John Blair, our assistant director, joining me tonight. Um, your health department continues to do good work for the people of Rutherford, and we're proud to serve. You should have our January report made available to you there. In keeping with our mission to protect, promote, and improve the health and prosperity of the people of Tennessee, January's report reflects that we're off to a strong start to the year and the numbers indicate that it's progressing exactly as it should. Um, some brief updates. Uh, with COVID-19, the CDC continues to rate our community level as low. We do continue our free testing, rapid testing available Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30. Vaccines free, available 8 to 10 or 1 to 3 Monday through Friday, no appointment needed, available for anyone six months of age or older. And boosters, um, anyone five years or older uh, are eligible, as long as it's been at least two months since the primary vaccination or the last booster. Um, you may have heard the federal government has announced that May 11th will officially end the COVID-19 public health emergency declaration. This is not an end to the pandemic, but an end to the emergency response phase and many of the policy allowances that were included in the National Emergency Declaration and the Public Health Emergency Declaration. While particulars remain to be seen, a subsequent announcement has indicated that there will still be a gradual step down in certain areas to avoid consequences of a sudden stop to some services. So as far as your health department is concerned, we will for the foreseeable future continue to offer testing and vaccines free to the public any changes coming our way will be given advance notice of and we will relate to this body accordingly. Flu shots are free and available during our walk-in hours from 8 to 10, Monday through Friday, anyone six months of age or older while supplies last. Um, recap on some good news, an event we had in February. On February 4th, we hosted our annual, our annual community baby shower at Patterson Park Community Center. This was our eighth annual baby shower. It was highly anticipated because it marked our return to an in-person event after being held virtually for the past two years. The health department hosts the yearly event along with community partners and in it we provi provide a day of informative classes, car seat safety checks, gift bags with diapers and baby bottles, door prizes, as well as a show floor with uh, vendors who highlight their services and resources for expecting mothers and families. Um, some numbers on the day, uh, we had 176 registered mothers, 328 total participants, that's family members and, and partners, 
Eight educational workshops were given and 156 people participated in those workshops. We had 56 vendors there, which was great because we anticipated about 40. And those were vendors providing services and resources. They weren't there to sell things to people. They were there to let people know about programming that was already available. And we had 70 door prizes and those included large items like play pens, car seats, things of real value to families in need. And we are very grateful to have had 36 community volunteers present that day. And we'd like to also extend a, a large thank you to this body, the Health and Education Commissioners who helped us spread the good word about the day. That does conclude my report. Any questions on the report? We have another piece of business, Commissioner Davidson. Uh, I believe you told us last month and I forgot, so if you could just remind me, if people wanted to donate to this for next year, yes, um, could you remind me how they do so? They can contact us at the health department. Our health educators kind of monitor this thing year round. We will begin probably in May planning for next year's event. And um, to that note, and I'm so glad you, uh, you asked that question, we do have some bags remaining, some gift bags remaining. So if you encounter any families in need, new, new moms, anything like that, you can refer them to us and we, we would like to get those to them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Oliver. Quick question, um, looking at COVID and flu, you said you're still doing the COVID testing. Um, what numbers do you have there or what's the data there? Um, you know how much testing is being done yeah now what we do is the rapid test and we give those out daily and we have really seen a sharp decline in those numbers and so it's kind of in keeping with what you've seen nationally um, they're, they're tracking lower than they have been now and uh, we hope that that continues you know as weather warms up so you don't have the numbers per I don't side. have specifics for you if I had to uh, estimate how many kits we give out a day less than 20 Okay, and then the flu, how is that going as far as numbers with the flu vaccines? The flu vaccine, our, uh, our utilization is kind of low, but we do still have some flu doses remaining. That's why we're still trying to make those available to people. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I know just a handful of people that have had COVID recently and they're using the home tests. Um, are those available? Yes. Or they just have to come in and get tested or? Right, no, that's actually what we do. We hand out the home test and if they're symptomatic, they can call us on the phone. We will run those out to the car. We will meet you in the parking lot. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Gooch. I know also, um, of course, it's all a community effort to get these home tests out to people, but uh, a lot of the insurance uh, are paying for four COVID tests and you can go to your local pharmacies. And I think the pharmacist can write the prescription right, and, yes, and give out four tests. Most insurance are paying for it. Um, FYI. Yes, sir. Thank you. If there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the report and then we have an amendment to discuss. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Director, are you, would you present the federal fund pass-through? Do you certainly, have that? Certainly. And um, what this is, the, the item presented before you um, for your approval, hopefully, is the annual co-op agreement between the state and the county um, for operation of the, the health department in Rutherford County. And what these represent, they're yearly agreements that define what the county pays and what the state pays towards operation of the health departments. And they often trail behind um, budgets and amendments because the figures in them are dependent upon those final numbers. So you will notice uh, usually first quarter of every year, um, the, this body will approve the, the co-op agreement for that fiscal year. So on your iPads, there are two documents. There's one is the agreement And it has the six hundred sixty-three thousand six sixty-eight support for Rutherford County, five hundred thirty-eight direct local funds, and one twenty-five six twenty-three of appropriations for which the county shall be billed in accordance. Mike, is there any 
funds from us or is this all passed through? If I put you on the... Yes, that, that, that's a good answer. There's also a, a note in your SharePoint that, okay, here we go, clarifies that this has been going on for 100 years and uh, where the state, we said, yes, we want a health department, the state funds it with some matching funds. There's a note that says there's no new funding for this fiscal year. And so this is essentially a pass through and a cleanup. Is that a safe statement, director? Yes, sir. Commissioner Chairman, Wilson. I move to approve. Do you have a second? A second. Any further discussion? Question. I was looking at the dates, so I'm trying to read this and, and get familiar with it. This is like a current, the current contract. Is that basically what this yes, is? Yes, ma'am, that's right. This started in so July. It says it July. was approved July 2022, Correct. but it wasn't approved then? Why, why are we just not getting this, it? This is the co-op that uh, kind of formalizes the agreement, the budget agreement, um, and, and the budget funding. And so what this started out, and I, I gave a little historical context, but after the Spanish flu pandemic of the uh, early 1920s, when the um, state, the governor's representative went to the counties and said, would you like a health department? And it probably started as a handshake agreement or a, a simple one pager. And after over 100 years, it's still only two pages as far as this co-op agreement, uh, this cooperative agreement goes. But um, yeah, it outlines the current year's funding that has already been approved. I understand the history there and I appreciate that. I'm just yes, curious as to why is this just now coming before us and it's February and it says July. So that's where I'm confused. Right. Uh, as far as I understand it, it's because uh, the totals included include the budget and any amendments that follow but that it always kind of happens first quarter of, of the following year, so. My, my recollection is the, the dollar amount could not be attached to the original agreement because the way the state does their books, it's in arrears. So we're approving tonight the dollar amount from an agreement. And, and I think Michael is asked to speak as well. So, so let me add something to, this agreement does state that it started July, however, for us to get all this paperwork together, if y'all remember last year, we, and you have seen an amendment this year with our contract with the state for one of our grants with the, through the health department where we amended to cover the raises. So we would, this, as y'all know, our budget's not usually passed until the last week of June. So that takes time to get all those documents and amendments together uh, for us to flush all this out. Um, now, could you have it a little sooner than the first quarter potentially, um, but also working with the state, um, they're not always in the, in a hurry, they're not always moving with a sense of urgency, so that's one of the reasons you're getting this in uh, February. It, does that just, make sense, Commissioner? I, I, I get it. Just an, as an aside, I find it kind of interesting because that's one of the things that, <clears throat> and I am a Tennessee State alum, but that's one of the things they noted in the hearings with Tennessee State is that the board signed it after it had already taking place and so now I'm seeing it looks like we kind of do the same thing so it's just just curious Commissioner Gooch okay just to be clear on, on a it says that the county responsibility is six hundred sixty three thousand six sixty eight and then uh, a and B it says um, 538 the county will not be billed I'm, I, got, I guess I'm kind of confused on that. As I understand it, the 663 is the total of that A and B. Um, and as I understand it, the, the 538 is direct local funds that the county shall not be billed. That may be the DGA contract money. And so it is reimbursed by the state. So the total, the, okay. the outlay with the county is actually doing is the 125,623. Got you, got yes, you, sir. Thank you. It's kind of like our match. The, the 125 is kind of like our match portion. Seeing no further questions, without objection, we'll do a roll call vote. <clears throat> Commissioner Davidson? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Boyd? Yes. Commissioner McMurray? Yes. Commissioner Gooch? Yes. Commissioner Oliver? Aye. Chairman Dodd. Yes. Motion passes.
And I think that concludes your yes, items. Thank you, Chairman. Thank real, you. Director, Director Comby, real quick. Yes, um, I just want to, in regards to piggyback to the community baby shower, I just want to give you and your staff um, a round of applause. Um, I attended that event, and I think I attended it right at 10 o'clock, and at that time it was 10 to 30. 20 to 30 individuals waiting to get in. So that just shows the level of, uh, you know, of care that you all are providing to the community. And, and thank you for doing that. And hopefully we can make it bigger and better next year. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Dr. Sullivan, we're going to move you up. Um, uh, folks, we, the, the mayor, is preoccupied for the moment and he is going to be involved in the just a brief report on CCRC so we're going to move that down and the mayor will be involved in other business so we without objection we will move community care to item five and you're up for yeah your special projects so yeah I'm sorry it, special projects my bad y'all Y'all could have came up for that too. Yeah, you, you might want to stay up here. <laughs> In case there's any detailed questions for that. So, pull that up in front of me. So tonight should be on your iPads. I think it made it on your iPad this month. So this report, and you will now get this monthly, and this will be done at the end of each month. And so it has been modified a little bit from from when y'all started um, from from earlier this year. Um, and so it now reconciles back with our fund 189. And so you can see the negatives for some of the projects on page three for some of the high school projects. That's kind of what we've talked about in the past where we've approved spending but haven't borrowed for those. But ultimately, it's listed out for every project that the commission has approved and that the board's approved. Are there any questions on that? If I just drop to the page four, page four, Funding approved but not obtained. It's a negative 3.4. Correct. That is the dollar amount that the commission has approved for the school board to spend that we will still have to obtain funding or borrow for. And that's related specifically to the high school additions. So those funds are, are available. The bills are being paid mm -hmm. through the school board. And, uh, fund balance or through the they're being paid i mean the county's paying them on, on the school you know all the all the bills are paid through through the county finance office but we're using the cash flow from this fund to pay those bills because as, you, as you'll note down there at the bottom there's 17 million dollars of cash at the end of january well some of that you can see all in that in that far right column is all the cash we're holding per project so as you can see we're we've got cash left over from projects or we've got projects that are ongoing that we're just using cash flow from other projects to fund the initial starter design phase of the high schools. Is that 17 million truly in cash? Or is it, is it bonded and in the bank is cash, but it's that 17 borrowed. million is truly in cash in the trustee's office. Not, not bonded money. We've got no, everything in this, almost everything in this fund is, is from bond proceeds. Um, but it is held in the trustee's office. So it is bond borrowed money held in the trustee. Okay. There may be a few transfers from, from a long time ago that could, but, 99.9% okay. yes is bond money. And, and some of these projects on here are, you know, could be completed. You know, it's leftover money waiting for the school board to request to move that to a to another project, which they do, frequ you know, frequently. Or, um, for example, you'll notice some money on here for land. You know, once they, if they were to move through with their purchase of the land, I think they're currently under contract for, um, you know, some of that would be paid, so. And we, uh, we've, I think we've already, it, it, we're in our new role as commissioners and as health and ed, I think we've actually transferred some of the money out of a, f a finished school. We, so we've moved some of these funds around w with our votes. There's a lot to take in here. Uh, thank you for updating it. And if you had any you know, immediate questions, we do have the school board, finance director, director, and the 
Director of Engineering here if you had any questions. And they are gonna report other items from the school board as well. And I just wanna to clarify too, my office keeps the numbers for this report. We do not, if there's any questions on the status or the percentage of completion, I can only give you a percentage of completion from budget. Um, the schools will have to give you a percentage of completion of the actual project as far as, you know, on-site inspections and things like that. Yes, ma'am. Because I was reading as you were speaking, Mr. Michael. Um, what did you say about the funding approved but not obtained? Can you explain that again? So, and this happens on the county side too, but generally, especially on the schools, when we go build a new school, so I'll just use an example on Plainview Elementary, we would have more than likely approved, approved them to go design that school money for them, but we don't wanna go borrow because we don't know what the cost is because it's not designed yet. So if you look down at the three high schools, or several high schools, um, there's money in there that has a budget, but then there's a negative over there, and most of them have a negative about a million dollars or a little over a million. What that is is this commission has said, hey, you can go contract with an architect firm, they design that, and then they go out to bids, which is what they've done. I believe they've received one bid back. Once they get those bids back, now we have an estimate of what to borrow because if we were gonna go do an addition to one of these high schools today without bidding it, we would have no idea. It'd be all of our best guess of what that would cost. So we don't wanna go borrow too much because then we're gonna be paying interest on money we didn't need to borrow or we don't wanna borrow not enough because then we'll be pay paying closing costs essentially twice. So we generally front the money uh, for the design process so that their architect, whoever they contract with, can get a set of construction drawings. Generally, I would assume they go ahead and submit that to the state fire marshal and everything before they bid it. Um, sometimes that's after or at the same time and then they'll get a price back, uh, which is kind of what we're fixing to go through here in the next month or two on, on some of this here. So does that make sense? Yes, now like I said, that it's, it's mainly for design, but I mean it could be a permit fee to the fire marshal's office, state fire marshal's office, they're paying out of that money too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that number will go will no longer be a negative, we'll get reimbursed. And well, when we, bar when, when we borrow, yes. So we'll be made whole when we borrow. And regardless, what I wanna point out is regardless, even if we choose not to do this project, we will still have to fund that amount is why it's on there. So even if we decided, hey, we're not gonna do any of these projects going forward, we still have to somehow come up with the money. We've paid those bills. So whether we go borrow for that or shift it from other projects, um, we'll still have to come up with that. And I, do, do we need to motion that? I, I'd entertain a motion to accept Michael's report and the discussion that occurred. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Dr. Sullivan <laughs> and team. So thank you, commissioners and guests. So we have quite a few things on the agenda because Brian is here today. Normally I'm the one reading the budget amendments. I'm gonna let Brian read the budget amendments so that he doesn't feel left out and we're all a team up here. So go ahead, Brian. Oh, yeah. Good evening, commissioners. I think you'll like this budget amendment because it's not asking for anything. It's actually accepting funding that comes from the federal Hold government. On, I want to do this budget amendment. <laughs> 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 so this one comes is for our centralized cafeteria fund fund 143 um, this FY 22-23 centralized cafeteria fund 143 amendment is to increase revenue and expenditures to recognize the awarded NSLP supply chain assistant grant rounds two and three from the United States Department of Agriculture this grant funding is in response to the unprecedented unprecedented challenges in purchasing and receiving food that operators of the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program are experiencing in school year 22-23. This reflects the grant award that was approved by the Tennessee Department of Education. This year, a grant award amount is in is $1,430,251. And the recommended motion is to amend the FY 2022-2023 Fund 143 to reflect the NSLP grant award of 1,430,251.
Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the grant receipt as presented. Second. And a second. Any discussion? We're clear to pass through. No new money, no. All right, uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Boyd? Yes. Commissioner McMurray? Yes. Commissioner Gooch? Yes. Commissioner Oliver? Aye. Commissioner Davidson? Yes. Chairman Dodd? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, now I have some of the fun things. So first thing I would like for you to do, uh, Mr. Lee handed you out a packet. The very last thing is probably the one that has the most attention. So it is our five-year building plan. Our board approved our five-year building plan on February 9th. So it's the very last page. Um, it says five-year building plan proposal number one at the back. So it should look like this very last page of the documents that you have. And there's a digital copy as well, if you prefer that. Is that on the SharePoint as well, all the pages? Not me, but is it? Okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. So a couple things I want to draw everyone's attention to on our five-year plan. One, this is something we do every year, and so this will change every year. I anticipate a bigger change because we're in the middle of a rezoning study. Um, so that rezoning study, we hope to have that back in April. That won't go into effect this coming school year, but it will go into effect for the 24-25 school year. Um, so if we'll just look at kind of these first, you will see our board uh, approved the five-year building plan with the ask of three additions and one elementary school. And so that is a change from what was presented last year. Last year, the request was for five high school additions. Um, it moved back to the Board of Education. Um, they requested three. That has not been funded yet, and so we're in the middle of that bid process. But as your commissioners are probably aware, we are really struggling in our Blackman Stewart Creek area, and we are in desperate need of an elementary school to relieve overcrowding multiple areas, but that's the one that is really struggling. So uh, to give you an update, so for this year, you'll see those numbers are $193 million. Uh, we realize how big of a request this is. Um, our problem is that if you notice going on down through each year, the numbers don't necessarily get less each year. Um, so over the next five years, we are looking at those three high school additions, um, two elementary schools, a middle school, and then two high schools. And so that is a huge number for a total of $744 million, almost three quarters of a billion dollars. So where we are struggling, we realize the ask that is, we will do everything we can. I'm sure this will change over time. I'm sure our rezoning will change that over time, but we are still consi consistently adding students. Um, and connecting with that five-year plan, I wanted to give you an update on our enrollment and then I'll kind of come back. So our enrollment, so we are still sitting in between that 50,800 and 51,000 students, depending on the day. Um, you don't have a copy of this portion. I'm just kind of going to go over some numbers because I want to hit an important point of this. We've talked a little bit about the TISA fast growing infrastructure stipend. So that is something with TISA, if you are a district growing more than 2% of your student enrollment for three consecutive years, that you're eligible for a fast growing infrastructure stipend to help with buildings. Statewide, that is only going to be $10 million. And so it is not going to be the huge benefit that we had hoped and anticipated. So that will be split among all districts that meet a 2% growth. Right now, there are three of us um, that would meet that if they don't make any modifications. We've had great conversations with our local delegation to help support that, to make sure that that stays in there and is not removed. But in TISA, it is one of those, if funding is left, it is the last thing funded. And so that has some potential, but we consistently are adding to that or 2 or 2% of our students. And I know 2% may not seem like a lot, but when we have gone from 2% of 35,000 students 15 years ago to now adding 2% of 51,000 students, we're consistently, we are not near that 2,200 student mark that we added last year, but we're well above that 1,000 student mark that we consistently hit. So we're continuing to look to need to add at least a school every single year based on our growth. 
Yeah, 51,000. So we go between 50,000, 800, and 51,000 without getting too technical. We have students that graduate in December, and so we have some cleanup data that is showing, not counting those right now, that you technically get funded for those students when they graduate early. So I wanted to hit on kind of that portion of it. The other thing of the enrollment update that I wanted to hit on, and then I'll kind of go back to the five-year plan for questions, we are noticing a big increase in the number of students who we refer to as Atlas, but that's McKinney-Vento. Those are our students who would classify as homeless, but it may not be the homeless of what you are thinking um, just automatically in your mind. Students who are doubled up in a household, so you may have two families that are living in one household, that technically counts as McKinney-Vento and Atlas for the homeless designation. Where that hurts us as a county is that we're still only getting property tax revenue for one house that's holding multiple parents or multiple families of students. And so that, that's another concern that we are currently facing, but we have to enroll students. Um, that's a federal law with McKinney-Vento that when they are in that situation that we do. So I wanted to hit on that. That's something we're noticing, especially on the north end but we are seeing it quite a bit as well at Stewart's Creek and Rockvale where some of our more expensive homes are. Families are moving together to be able to live in those zones and one actually would count. So that's an enrollment update and I kind of know I skipped around a little bit. I'm going back to the five-year plan. So any questions um, as far as the five-year plans other than what in the world are you thinking bringing that to us? I'll just uh, jump in, not, not just ironically. Uh, Jeff and I have been here a few years, and I've seen this. So if you just do an average, 700 million in five years, I mean, it's gone from 80 million a year to 90 to 100 to, what is it, 148? Have you done the math, Phil? The, the, if you add them all together, 744 million divided by five, it's $148 million a year is, is the average anticipated ask so I know Jeff and I've been distressed by that number and it's double what we used to see I just I'm just pointing that out it's just a, a point of context the numbers are large and uh, distressing uh, Commissioner Wilson thank you chairman and as far as this evening we're listening to the report of okay. the school board but there's no voting on anything or acceptance of doing anything forward we're just listening to the report what they've decided to do and we'll continue to talk about it as bids come in i know we're talking about that soon because i know we've got the bids coming in for oakland and riverdale over the next couple of weeks so those three high school additions will be discussed likely at our next health and ed meeting agree this is not an ask this is this is a presentation the the board of education voted and asked for 193 million but the bids aren't in, et cetera. So it's not in a position that it can officially be asked for us to consider and send a budget, but we thought it's important just to keep that gross number in front of us. As you sit on your other committee boards and you're looking at our total budget year, just the, the significance of these, of these dollars. And I, I notice we have some Board of Education folks here, Ms. Maxwell and Ms. Morales, thanks for joining us. Question. Yes, um, regarding these additions that are supposed to assist with overcrowding, I guess, how many seats does this add to each of these? Yeah, be happy to go over each one of those individually. So if we are looking at part of this, we did rezone last year to Riverdale specifically to be able to add more seats for students. So Riverdale last year was about 1,900. This year we're sitting a little bit over 2,100. So as of right now, the additions would put us at 2,500. Um, from a logistic standpoint, 2,500 is still huge. When we are looking at seats, I know that that potential is, can you put more than 2,500 in there for the number of kids? So if you're looking at Riverdale from where we are right now, it would add 400 seats at Riverdale High School. It would remove those portables from Riverdale High School, but it would not remove portables. We would use those somewhere else. Uh, I feel like being transparent, we would have to use those portables somewhere else. Smyrna High School is sitting right over 21, 2200. Um, so you're looking at about 300 seats that it would add there. That school has more portables than any other school in Rutherford County. And so we would remove those portables from Smyrna. But again, we would utilize them across the district. There's a couple we would probably have to get rid of because I don't think we could move them again. Would you? 
<laughs> there's there's one in particular I know that would not we we can't move again and then Oakland High School is right at 2000 about 1980 so you're looking at adding 500 to 520 seats there so total you're looking somewhere between 1100 and 1200 seats um, for our additions and all of these will be maxed at 2500 is what correct. you're saying correct yes and what about the projections for the capacity for the new elementary west school yeah new elementary schools we build that plan especially if we were to put it on the property we're looking at which is the Beatty property we would want to turn that around very quickly so we would use a current design and that is capacity of a thousand Mr. Gooch. Okay, so if I'm counting this up correctly, I'm, I'm looking at over five years, and of course things change. At five additions, two elementary, two middle, and two high schools. Correct. On the other possible projects. Glad you brought that up, yes. Those are ones we are looking in-house to be able to fund. And so I realize the ask this is, so we are trying to figure out any additional funds that we can get and apply for. Um, those two CTE centers, so the governor has announced um, Innovative Model Schools grant, and so we will get about 16 million for that. Um, that is supposed to be used for high school innovative projects. We are in such a great space with CTE in our district, um, largely because of our funding body and our board of sponsoring that. We may be able, and what we're hoping to be able to do is be able to develop two CTE centers. And that was a question that our board asked during the interview process. How do we make it so it doesn't matter what zip code that you were happen to live in, that students have opportunities for whatever um, program of study, whether right now we'll take aerospace that is only at Siegel, and what about students who live in other parts of the county, making sure we can do that. I put those on here because they're important that if we're able to build those centers with that grant, that should be able to lower the cost of some of our high schools eventually when we build new high schools because we would have more of a CTE type center. That same thing with the alternative school in Rutherford County Learning Academy, we realize, and I'm gonna talk about our budget priorities here in just a little while, that is an area that we need as a district. We only allocate just over $2 million for alternative school. We're a different district than we were 20 years ago when we only had two alternative schools and we have the same number of seats. We also have some very specific learning needs of some of our very high risk students that we are trying to serve in a regular education setting that is probably not the best. Um, and districts our size need their own type of facility to be able to do that. But we're looking at being able to utilize TISA as part of that funding. And you said the TISA funding, you mentioned the $10 million. You yep. said it's split between three different districts? Yep. Okay. The fast growing infrastructure stipend, yes. And these um, potential, I guess, projects you have here, that would be like one time money? Yes, they're one time money. They allow you to use it for staffing. For the first year, I believe you can do 100 or 75%, but every year of the grant, it lowers. And so it's not a very sustainable model for us to do 100% of staffing one year. And then the next two years later, you can only do 25%. That would be a larger ask on the county as we move forward. So that's not what we're looking at. And CTE is federal funding? It's a mixture. You do have some federal with Perkins um, federal grants, but then you also have quite a bit of local or state and local funding as well. Part of that is a pass through that it comes from the federal government to the state government. So it's it's a mixture. I can think out of our 141 account, we budget just over $11 million in teachers. So it's not strictly federal. Commissioner Wilson. Thank you, Chairman. And I believe I heard that the state will be starting to report their projections for our first TISA funding soon. Is that correct? So we'll at least start, you guys will start having real numbers on at least uh, real estimated numbers to start putting your budget together. Is that right? And that's coming very soon. I will believe that, Commissioner, when I see it. But I'm hopeful. I ask the question with much optimism. That was a lot of optimism that I'm glad you have the optimism, and I'm going to go with you on that. Timing being of the essence yes. on pretty much everything we discuss these days, um, we're looking at needing to possibly talk about these additions at our next meeting. Right. 
knowing how the money is all looking and coming together has an awful lot to do with our decisions. I know you're in the same boat that we are. So Correct. I know a lot of people that are watching don't even understand this new funding formula. So just so they know, we don't even have the estimate yet of what our first look at the funding will look like yet. Correct. You guys, so you guys can't even really start going to work on the numbers. So just so everybody understands, changing from the BEP to TISA is causing this to be new for all of us at a time where we're making some pretty heavy choices. So. And if I can add to that, BEP was not a really fast, swift system either. So last year, for example, we got our final BEP allocation in July, which is well after the fiscal year's already been voted on and approved. And so TISA may offer a little bit better, but I am concerned about the timeline. Mr. Gooch. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Director. Um, so a new high school, it looks like I'm looking at the North End, projected to be 137 million. Correct. Okay. And, and how many seats would that? When we are building, so when we just built Rockville, we built it for 2200 roughly, between 22 and 24, depending on the design. Okay. so. It looks like that we're building three, in 2023, three additions that will add 1,200 for a total cost of around 136 million. So if a constituent was to ask me, would it be cheaper to build another high school instead of the additions, what, what do I, what, what could I tell them? So I think you're looking at two things. That The answer to that simple question is yes, you gain more seats by, I mean, that's just the honest truth. You gain more seats by building a new high school. These buildings are 50 years old, and so we are concerned of, about the upkeep and how to make sure that they are sustained as a school to house that many students. Um, go ahead. Well, so why not build a third high school instead of the three additions? Because we are still going to have students in those schools that are in the shape of needing renovations right now as well. I didn't understand the question, the answer. Yeah, so when we are looking at those high schools, those high schools need support. And so we're able, I'll use Smyrna High School as a perfect example for the bid. So our bid came in a little bit under um, what we projected. Did it come in at 30 million roughly, Trey? Yeah, 29 roughly, you will see on here, we projected 41 million. We are gonna be able to take care of some things in Smyrna High School as part of that, that the facility needs anyways, like a brand new roof. Regardless of what we do, we're gonna have to address those facilities. And instead of it being on this fund, I'm gonna, we're gonna have to come before you and fund 177 and say, we need these additional funds instead here. I think I, I get, get what you're saying. So the additions, the cost includes upgrades to the building. To bring it in, in line. It, it, it's separate from adding seats. Correct, you were looking from an equity standpoint of all of our schools to make sure that our schools, our students have opportunities at all of them. That's not to say that that isn't dissimilar at the elementary and middle level. We have those areas as well. High school is more costly because you have your specialized programs. Gotcha. Yep. And I, that's an argument that I, I fully, I understand both sides of that. And that's one as a board we've talked about. One of our initiatives is to try to take care of our older buildings. But it's more than just on the additions, it's more than adding Absolutely. seats. It's to upgrade different parts of the building that we would need to upgrade regardless. Yep. Okay. And one that you don't want to get too in specific because I can talk to you individually about if safety is one we talk about gotcha. quite a bit. And we won't share kind of those concerns in public. Our schools are safe. That is not to say that we can't, you can never predict an unimaginable tragedy. But we have cameras, we have gates, like our schools are safe. But if you're looking at a campus like Oakland or like Riverdale or even like Smyrna with their number of portables, they're in a different situation than a school like Rockvale, Stewart's Creek, where everybody's encompassed into one building with a courtyard separated. Great questions. Yes, sir. Commissioner Phillips. Just a point, uh, that question has come up about building a new school versus adding on to schools and uh, the, the point with Riverdale and Oakland both, those schools are 50 years old and they were built to be 50 years old, but that doesn't mean that uh, they don't need some updating and expanding those schools to match the existing other high schools would make the zoning to me much more desirable simply because we're not building a new school close to the other ones we're expanding the schools which will be expanding the zones uh, and we're not having to buy property so expanding those schools and updating those schools makes perfect sense at this particular point in time uh, and 
the new schools that we build will also be the 2,500 for student population. And this is bringing those kind of up to date with that. And once again, if we built a new high school, we'd probably build it, I've always said five miles from an existing high school, and we wouldn't have to do that by expanding these high schools. It, to me, it makes a, a, a lot of sense as we move forward. The, the, the issue with, with um, uh, security, um, I, I know it won't solve every issue that could possibly come up, but it would improve that situation uh, quite a bit. Uh, Smyrna uh, is not as old as Riverdale and Oakland, but it's still 35 years old somewhere in that neighborhood is that is that about right and and i think laverne is in that same situation so those two schools would also need need updating and also adding to the core value laverne especially when you get down to laverne you've got a city that's landlocked by davison county on one side and smyrna on the other side and it's hard for them to grow from a physical perspective but they're growing as fast as any community so uh, t to leave Laverne with its identity will need to be expanded in my mind uh, instead of building a new school and taking Laverne students and transferring them someplace else. So t to me, to, uh, to take these older schools and, and uh, to update them, make them more secure, and not have to build a new school close to existing schools makes a tremendous amount of sense and that's the way I've been trying to explain it to people those schools need attention and I've questioned in the past how Davison County could build a school cheaper than we could build it uh, but, but we've just answered that question we build schools to last for a long 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 time where we don't have to tear that thing down and build new ones and it just makes a lot of sense that uh, we maintain those schools and whatever those schools need uh, going forward um, from a maintenance perspective we need to make sure that we take care of those it's just like a roof down at, at Smyrna as an example we need to take care of those existing schools and and bring them up to par with what the other schools um, are so to me it just makes a tremendous amount of sense uh, that we do that uh, we probably could build an existing school, but when you add property and you add road improvements and you add all of those kind of things, I'm not sure it would be uh, cheaper. Commissioner Oliver, did you have? Uh, I did, um, because just to follow up what he said, so the high school in North End is going to be 2,500. I thought you just said it was going to be like 21, 2,200. If we are looking, that was for uh, what our, Commissioner Phillips just said it was going to be 2,500. So that's a great question. So the answer to that as our designs are usually for 2500 we have seagull is a great example seagull we left out part of our cte wing rock did we leave out part of a ring rockville high school we left out because of funding we end up having to cut some classrooms to meet the number that is budgeted we designed them for that big but as far as actually building them sometimes funding doesn't allow it to get to that 2500 Commissioner Wilson. Thank you, Chairman. And I've listened to all the comments from everyone tonight, and I just wanted to throw a few on since we're talking about it. Most of us have met with all the principals at the three schools and discussions, Smyrna, uh, uh, Riverdale, and Oakland. And a couple comments I want to make are, and uh, Chairman Phillips is correct, it's not just about seats for these students. One of the big parts in what I took away from the principals myself was a general excitement of the facilities being upgraded to make them closer to those that we offer at the newer schools. And all three of them were looking at different things that were gonna serve their particular student bodies. It was different upgrades to things like auditoriums and just different aspects that they were very excited about. So I do believe part of this is not just seats, it is actually bringing up those schools and, and taking care of some of those maintenance issues all together. Um, because of that, that's why, you know, I've been more supportive of continuing what the previous commission had discussed, which was to, to fund these additions 
uh, and it's to get those schools up to par so that as we do move on to new schools when necessary, you know, the existing schools know we've taken care of the needs of those students and done the best we can to give them the same facilities as someone, you know, that's 15, 20 miles north of them in the county. So I believe that's the importance of seeing these through. And those principals really convinced me of the difference this is going to make not only for their students, but also for the teachers, the faculty, and the people at the school that are looking forward to these facilities. Because, you know, right now they're using every closet, not just for students, but they've got storage buildings outside. I know Stewart's Creek had to purchase, you know, buildings just to for storage as they move people. And they're not even a school we're talking about in addition for it. That's just one that might end up getting moved around as our school board has to go through the painstaking process of looking at a rezoning next year. So um, I believe these additions are a lot more about getting those facilities up for the future as we continue to move forward and those students and the faculties do not feel left out. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner. I Alderman. agree um, with your comments, but I would also state that maintenance is majorly needed at Laverne High School. I mean, ceiling tiles, lights, paint, working water fountains. I mean, the swim area where they have swim meets is horrible. So we need to look at maintenance, even though the expansion is going to be later. Um, it needs some work. That may segue into the next. So if, okay. thanks for that, that was informational. Thanks yeah. for the discussion. Um, I think we can move on to the, to yeah. the maintenance fund. Then. So we'll get into maintenance, which we call capital projects. What's it called, okay, capital, capital projects. projects. Yeah, cat, capital projects. So Commissioner Oliver, there's something I also wanna hit on. So part of kind of talking about TISA funding, and it's something that we've, we've kind of talked about a little bit as a district, but I think it's very important. We've had lots of conversations with Dr. Hatchett, the principal of Laverne High School. Where Laverne High School is, we are not specifically sure we want to build a huge addition there. I mean, talking with her, she is very much on board with doing a complete renovation of her school to bring it back up to in line with what the other schools look like. I am hopeful that with extra TISA funding, we can go ahead and start tackling some of that as a district through Fund 177 instead of us having to come back before the commission and say, we need $43 million to ask for a new addition. That may also change if you look, and this is how that five-year plan is fluid. If we're able to kind of tackle some of that Laverne High School issue, we may not need to do a Blackman High School addition as well that saves us funding to be able to move towards a newer high school on the north end of that third year. So those are all discussions that are coming. This is knowing that this first year was just trying to move forward with the previous commission, realize that we did not actually build anything new this year, so we added 2,200 kids and we didn't build anything, so we're further behind. But Dr. Hatch at Laverne High School and our staff are very well aware that we need to do some things to even attract teachers to Laverne High School. Yep. So, um, moving to Fund 177, I'll turn it over to Trey here in just a minute. Just a little bit of background. We call this capital projects. So these are looking at our major projects of our building. Um, just some background. This is the bull and nickel on the tax levy. So it was five and a half cents. Um, it moved to four cents last year. As a district, we added an additional seven cents and the county approved us moving seven cents from general purpose to the capital or to 177 so that we instead of having seven and a half million dollars we're able to tackle about 18 million dollars in deferred maintenance this is the one that got a lot of media of attention last year that um, we're over 200 million dollars in deferred maintenance behind Trey and our team and our principals have done a great job identifying that but I also want to call out that is not unique to Rutherford County that's not unique to government in general if we were to do just an allocation of Rutherford County government buildings we're going to find deferred maintenance because we're a public entity and aren't like a private sector so the only other things i would add is that we've started um, part of our budget process this year is that we met with each principal individually and they gave us a rundown of what did their facility look like in collaboration with myself brian trey dr chastain and dr anthony our other assistant superintendents to go over exactly the needs of every facility so i do envision new items on this 177 based on what principals kind of looked at um, trey i'm going to turn it over to you to kind of go over this lovely thing <coughs> Well, I'm not getting off into the what's coming. We're going to deal with where we are. This is this year's fun. Uh, the handout that you have, and I'm going to put my glasses on quickly. Uh, I'm going to give you a overview of where the funds are right now. Uh, and we're not going to talk about next year. Currently, uh, we had roughly 
23,827 of that uh, about 5 million is what we call carryover. They were projects that were started in the previous year that were under contract that were not completed. So if you look at your first two pages of this, this is the carryover projects and that's exactly what it says at the top. They're carryover from the previous year. About halfway down on page two, that budget was 4 million. $26,089.18. Currently, there's $210,000 left, meaning we've completed all but two of those projects. They're all complete, which this is fairly typical at this time of year. We have a large number of projects that carry over. Usually our goal is by Christmas, we try and have them all finished. Uh, the, the, the anomaly in this report is at the bottom of the first page. The turf for the football field, 153,647. That is the Smyrna High donation that was made for their field. And because it was such a large donation, it was the, the entire fund, the money was placed in this project. This is not money that was funded by the county. It was by a private donation, but due to its size was put into this fund for us to manage. So if you take that 153 out, we got roughly $60,000 of projects left. And most of those, uh, we got uh, one at Oakland, one at Riverdale, two at Riverdale. And those will be finished up here in the next little bit. So that gets us to the roughly $18 million that was provided for this year, which is halfway down on page two, it says 22, 23 projects. These are the projects that were approved by this, by the school board and by this body for us to work on. That's the capital projects, the maintenance projects, so to speak, that were approved to take care of in this fund. If you look at the first column, it's the budget after amendment. There's some amendments that we make to this as we bid out these projects, as we do these projects. All of these projects are estimated a year prior. Been a lot of price increases in the last year. So as we get to these projects, some projects come in a little under budget, some come a little bit over. Some come in significant enough that we don't get to do the project at all. But we shift the monies that's here. We do not add monies unless it's in, in this budget from other funds, but we shift them from one project to another. And when we do that, we go back to the board. They know what's going on. We come before you guys and it becomes a budget amendment. So if it's, that's the budget or budget after amendment, and then on the far right side is remaining. Um, the next to the last column is spent or encumbered. When we write a purchase order, it becomes encumbered, meaning that money is scheduled to be sent. So you'll spent. You'll see a couple of projects in that first category on page two, HVAC, John Coleman Annex, Laverne High Weight Room. Those projects had to be designed and then put out for bid. We're just now getting those bids in, so we're gonna be writing some of those purchase orders in the next few weeks, which is typical for this time of year. So this is an accounting of all of the projects that we're working on. Uh, if you go to page three, at the top you'll see a 10 portables, 1.6 million. I just wrote the PO yesterday or the day before for the portables. So 1.3 million of that is now gone. Um, but because this is a snapshot in time, if we've written a purchase order or things have been encumbered after this report was printed, it's not reflected here. But this is just an accounting of all the different projects. If you look to the um, next to last page, it says school request. These are the items that the individual principals request that we include in this fund. Um, so as Dr. Sullivan was stating, we just got through meeting with those principals uh, for this year. Um, it was um, 1.4 million roughly this year is what the principal request came up to. They're a little over 4 million this year, so we're gonna have to as I call it, I'm gonna play Solomon again and with Dr. Sullivan's assistance and split the baby to try and get that number down 
to a number that we can manage. Unfortunately, that means there's some things that we have to go, okay, it'll wait. It, it can wait. We have something with more dire needs and we do it forward. So if you look at the last page of this, it's a very short page. It's the conclusion of all of this. Budget amendments, af budget after amendments, 23 million, 827. Four million of that is already spent. That's the projects from last year. So we get down to about 18 million, which is what we were budgeted for this year. Currently it's showing 13 million remaining. I mean, that's 13 million that we haven't written, con that it's not contracted yet. However, I'm gonna give you three quick numbers and this number's gonna go away very quickly. In the HVAC category, there's $9 million worth of projects. All of those are gonna be encumbered in the next few weeks. So there's 9 million of that 13 that's gonna be, we're gonna write contracts for that's gonna be gone quickly. Portables, I just told you we wrote the contract for 1.3 million. Roofs, we've got 691. There's a couple of those that'll be taken care of. And then $400,000 worth of locks, doors, and life safety. If you take those out of the picture, we're down to a million four left uncontracted. At this time of the year, we're halfway through our school year, our, our, our budget year. We've got 1.4 million that we have yet to contract, which is less than 20% of the total, meaning it's about where we are normally at this time of the year. It's not unusual. Um, brief, quick history. There's, there's a little, th this started out and I'm gonna have to defer to Mr. Phillips, about 10, 12 years ago, maybe a little longer is how this fund got started. Dr. We, I still call it Dr. Bullen's nickel. Okay, so when that started, we were, we were having to come to, the, to this body every time we had a 100,000 or $50,000 project. And this body decided they're wearing us out coming over here and wasting time. Let's allocate X amount of dollars, uh, and it was Dr. Bullen's nickel, and allocate that for capital projects, let them determine the projects and bring them to us for approval. That's kind of how this fund got started. With that, there was no fund balance, meaning we started out with zero in the bank. This fund is strictly from property tax. The vast majority of the property tax dollars does not come in until November, December, and January. So we would spend the first from July 1 to basically to Christmas with no money to do any projects. Over the years, we as the school board has built up a little bit of savings. This project came in a little le less money, whatever it drops. We've built a, a savings account, so to speak. Fund balance <laughs> went blank there for a minute. We now have enough money in our fund balance that we can self fund that first half of the year, which allows us with these larger projects to start them earlier so that we can tackle more of them in the budget year. My accounting friends don't like it when we carry a bunch of things over another year. It requires additional work on their part. So we try and finish as many as we can. So there is now a fund balance here. There has been a time or two that we've come before you and asked to use a little bit of that fund balance. We do not, my personal um, philosophy, I don't wanna go below five million in that fund because that's about, if we stay where we are, that's what we need for the carryover projects and for the first half of the year. So I say that we have a fund balance now uh, for your benefit so that when we come before you and say we would like to, and I'm coming next month, uh, to ask to spend $150,000 on uh, a school that's fire alarm got hit by lightning and, and we can no longer get the parts. I need to fix it. That's an emergency 
uh, something that we don't want to take away from another project that's already here. I don't want to move money from that project, but we need to move some money out of fund balance. It's money that the board, it's already there, and we would use it for emergencies and as our starting fund for the next year. There are times that we do get a little above that, but we gradually spend it back down through the year. And I'm telling you all this so that you know that there is a fund balance in this project, in this fund, and we would like to maintain it at that point so that we can self-fund going forward. It's been a very good partnership, I think. Uh, we've tried to do as many projects as we can and spend the money as best we can. So that's the... 177 history and update for this month. And before I go to the 189, if there's any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer. Thank you. Uh, I do have a question. I don't see Roy Waldron on this list. Does that mean the principal didn't request anything or what? On the second page, my answer to that would be they did not request anything last year for capital projects. Well, I've seen that school as well. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> sure. That will be one of our priorities as well. We have a brand new principal, and that is something we've talked about with our principals is they had an addition several years ago, and our principals got into the habit of when they got an addition, they felt like they were just funded, don't ask for anything and that puts the next principal in a bind. And so that's part of why we did every budget meeting with principals was to say, do not wait until it is to a point of broken to ask. And she asked for quite a bit with pictures, a slideshow, all kinds of information that we plan to address. So her list is fairly lengthy this year. But if you look at, and, and I don't wanna get off into the weeds again, if we spend 200, Two million dollars out of this, and I'm going to use the number that we last year, somewhere right around eight million dollars. We've got some very hefty capital fund projects. If we allocate, and I'm going to use a number just for conversation's sake, if we use two million for the principal's request, the things that they would like to get for their building, two million dollars, that only works out to forty thousand dollars a school. Now. To paint a gym is $25,000. $40,000 does not go very far in today's time. And I'm gonna back up for a minute on the conversation earlier about the schools and how many we've built and all that sort of thing. When I started 16 years ago, we were building schools for $95 a square foot. They're 325 to $350 a square foot now. And we are building as cheap or cheaper than anybody in the mid-state area. We still are. When I look at these numbers, they're astronomical. But we've had in HVAC alone in, in the last 12 months, we've had three 15% price increases just on HVAC equipment. And when I budget in a, a year ahead, in these times, it makes me extremely nervous because the, the market is so fluid right now. But we were successful at Smyrna, and I'm hoping that Oakland and Riverdale are going to be just as successful when we get those bids. I think they're good with that 189. Okay. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Lee? Thanks for that. And of course, this was our first... This was our first exposure to that, and, and I know we'll have more, more questions moving forward, but, but I've been advertising that, that Trey's coming, so. Yep. Thank you, yep. Mr. Lee, excuse me, Mr. Lee's. Trey's a valuable member of our team, does an amazing job with what he has. Um, yeah. Connected to that real quick, you will see, we realize how big of an ask this is. Our board will be continuing a discussion that I mentioned last time with Health and Ed, which is the um, energy savings uh, potential contract that we have. We realize 200 million to ask for capital projects, so we're trying to figure out a way that we can fund some of that other avenues. It's not great, but we're hoping to be able to knock, if all things go through, somewhere around 40 million off of some of this as well um, as we move forward. Next, just last one I wanted to hit on. So we talk a lot about 141, our general purpose. Uh, the commission doesn't see 142 very much. That's our federal funds. 
143 is the other one that the commission is, is really involved with approving. That is our cafeteria funds, and this will be very brief. You guys approved an amendment um, today. So our cafeteria fund, fund 143, um, with that, we'll just, for conversation's sake, say that it goes all the way through budget and county commission for amendment purposes. Is it about $28.7 million? However, for revenue, we're only gonna bring in 24.7. So it is losing money this year. Um, it's losing money for several reasons. One is the cost um, inflation and everything else. We also have a huge meal debt this year. Where we're struggling is getting our students to fill out for introduced lunch forms. And so we are gonna add that as a required document for part of our student registration next year for students that parents have to click that before they move forward to hopefully increase those um, risks. Couple things about revenue, just so you have some perspective. For that revenue of 25 million roughly, about 6.5 million comes from lunch payments alone, so people paying for lunch. 12 million comes from USDA reimbursements. Three million is for breakfast, and then commodities is another 1.5 million. That doesn't come up to 24.7, it comes up to about 18, but that is how three-fourths of our funding for revenue comes out of 143. Um, just wanted to kind of give you a quick update. You'll see more of 143, but it's usually a pretty simple one. We are gonna discuss looking at our prices for cafeteria again. Unfortunately, if we increase prices, that's gonna increase our um, bad meal debt that we call it as well. Currently, we have a lunch is $3.25 for elementary and $3.50 for middle, and teachers are $4.25 um, and for guests. If we go much higher, you're really struggling with the affordability for some of our students. So. It just your first comment was your cost, your budget's twenty eight. Yep. And your revenue's twenty four point seven. So you're 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 upside down this year, pushing yes. four million. Yes, but this fund fluctuates. So we were very much in COVID struggling. We were very well under. We have a very any idea what our fund balance is right now? It's so it's about thirteen million in fund balance. It's a healthy fund right now that as the economy kind of fluctuates, we see ups and downs um, with this fund. If it does not continue to, we're gonna have to look at things internally. I'll tell you one of the ones that we look at is how do we go back and get some of this bad meal debt? But a huge portion of that is the big difference right now is again, that number of students that are filling out for introduced lunch because we are used to getting more than $12 million in USDA reimbursements. And so that, that is huge for a district our size. Question. Yes, ma'am. Now, I understand you say so you're going to require that the document is completed, and I'm sure you're aware of some of the reasons why it's not completed. Right. So, how are you going to ensure safety? Or have you even thought about ensuring safety for these families that Correct. are being required to fill out these documents? Correct. Ultimately, I still think they'd be able to bypass it because I don't, there's not a legal way that I can force someone to fill out that form for funding. Um, Commissioner Schwinn actually mentioned that, so she's our Tennessee Department of Education Commissioner. She mentioned that um, at a meeting with superintendents last month that talked about how Davidson County has a huge issue with this. Rutherford County is going to continue to see that as you have undocumented students who, whatever the reason being, we still are educating all students um, in our district, but those students' parents for fear are not going to fill out the form. I don't know a perfect answer for that. I wish I did, I do not. And I have a small child care center and I have non-speaking families that don't want to fill out the CACFP, you know, so yep. just a concern. And, and the safety you're referring to is, the, 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 is that they, what would be the unsafe result of filling out the paperwork? Immigration, Scrutiny ICE. from ICE, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chairman Phillips, did you have any any comments on the cafeteria? I know that that you wanted to get that in front of this board, or any anyone else. It's really hard to kind of present those information. Uh, that information that it, it doesn't sound fair to one segment of the community, and it sounds really something that we ought to be doing as a community. But uh, is there federal assistance for uh, that that we're are we fully funded by some federal assistance or is there more federal assistance available to us when it comes to uh, um, free and reduced and well, that or is a, 
That is a catch-22 question, because currently there is a push in the state legislature to not take federal funds. I don't know what the likelihood of that occurring, um, but that is something that is occurring in our state. Um, the other aspect that I would say that I think I have more belief in is there's also legislation talking about Tennessee paying for lunch for all students. That would obviously kind of take care of some of this issue that we're looking at right now. Um, I haven't checked to see how that bill actually should go. It should be in the Senate committee tomorrow, so I haven't checked to see how that bill is doing. From a federal designation, no, I believe we're getting everything that we're allocated to get right now. Set me up for that one. <laughs> I'm just joking, Commissioner Bills. All right, so that concludes the informational aspects of this presentation. So if there's no other questions, we've got uh, some other items. Excuse me, Commissioner Gooch. If we're done with their report, but, um, and this has nothing to do with anything we're discussing, um, but it just come into my mind. Um, a few weeks ago, I met a young man who's just come over from Honduras. He doesn't speak a word of English. How do we deal with that? That is a daily basis. And so we have multiple things within our schools. So it is with our English as a Second Language program. And if a student is a newcomer, then we have newcomer classes at each one of our schools that that student is really working on conversational language. So how can we teach basic, English instruction, English language acquisition, so that our students can be able to function in a regular classroom. Once they develop some of that language acquisition, then they go into a more structured, regular classroom like you're thinking about, um, but then they would be pulled out for a minimum of one hour a day to receive um, language acquisition instruction. So that is a, a daily occurrence in not all of our schools, but I agree completely. Appreciate you bringing it up. I'd like to make a quick comment. Um, as a former uh, teacher, having non-English speaking students, I took it upon myself to translate and have documents translated. Um, I know teachers talk about being overworked, but it's just a level of compassion, you know, um, because you want them to be able to understand the curriculum. You want them to be able to understand what's going on in the classroom. And it's a short learning curve. <laughs> they don't have a lot of time. so. A lot of times I would just translate documents and things of that nature to assist the families. Mr. Wilson. And Dr. Sullivan, do we still have open ESL positions as we speak? Yes. And that's probably one of the toughest things for us to understand is where the need is so great. We have opportunities to employ ESL educators and we're not able to get them. And these are things we have to look at. I know this is something the school board and you guys are talking about constantly. What do we have to do to get a teacher to want to come to our county? Because just as Commissioner Gooch said, we have a real need out there to serve these kids and we can't fill these positions and we're trying. Especially and that's the position of where we are. You're looking at our English as a second language students. We are one of the most diverse districts. Yes, Metro Nashville, yes, Shelby. We are much more diverse than Knox County, even though there's 7,000 students bigger than us. We are much, much more diverse, especially with our English as second language students. And we don't, and never, I don't see how we ever get to what Metro Nashville pays. But when you have that right on your doorstep, we, we don't attract the English as second language teachers from Metro Nashville. So it's, we have to grow our own, and we have a new partnership with Lipscomb where we're growing our own, which is working. Um, but that's five, but five is better than the zero we had. So we're excited for our five. Thank you, Director. Thank you. You're probably gonna shoot me because of this, but uh, our five-year plan uh, just talks about our school system and doesn't deal with the additions of the request for the outside school systems that are applying here. What do we call them? Charter. charter schools. Thank you. Uh, do they fit into this five-year plan in any way, shape, form, or fashion? No. I would like to tell you that let's take the – there's a school that just um, springs who's actually going to be part of our own um, portfolio who are excited to join us. Springs uh, has bought 10 acres, um, and they're hoping to put 800 students on 10 acres. 
I look forward to seeing that plan. Um, we are not capable of putting 800 students on 10 acres with our roads and everything. I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, they've been a good partner and I'm optimistically curious to how that's going to work. But when you're looking at that um, and that whole school choice portfolio, they're taking students from across the county and homeschool students. I don't anticipate it being a huge change for us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, guys, and thank you, and thank you commissioners, um, to remind us that in addition to the nuts and bolts of dollars and cents, we have an obligation to be compassionate and to look after and to be part of the well-being of, of our folks. So thank you for that, y'all. Um, let's uh, let's have a motion to approve the reports. So all moved. Right. Do I have a second? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? We are going to move on to the uh, CCRC. We do have some other business tonight, but CCRC has been moved down to this position. And I, I don't think we'll be here very long, but I, I know the, the mayor has, has been at the last board meeting. So if you have any updates for us. Um, none that I can think of that's germane to the committee, except for the idea of the uh, daycare is still on hold. Um, uh, I know that the currently um, the current contract for um, United Church Homes for CCRC has not been automatically renewed. How I want to stipulate, or I want to say, that does doesn't mean it won't be renewed. It just means it hasn't been automatically renewed. That contract will come up to, for renewal um, the first of next year. And so we're in the process of discovering, or the board is in the process of discovering best options with regard to how to move forward. And so we're in, uh, having very productive and constructive con uh, discussions with the United Church Homes in that regard. So um, we're just kind of in a wait and see. Very good. Thank you. Um, we had, on your SharePoint, we have, uh, I had Rachel upload uh, CCRC documents. CCRC history and values, mission, and a vision, mission, and values, just for information. Also, I had, we had some questions from commissioners. Both of those are, are on the SharePoint. The first set of questions of the, I'll say 10 questions, seven, are answered on the document entitled CCRC documents. The remaining questions that you have that were presented, market value of property, value of property and land, and further on the next sheet, questions about cost to taxpayers and revenue generated. Those questions have been sent to the Rutherford County Budget Director, to the Board Finance Director, CCRC Board Finance Director, and to the CCRC attorneys with a request that those questions be answered at our March meeting. So we can look forward to hearing about that on March 28th. And if there are any other questions about CCRC. I would like to recognize the uh, administrator of, of CCRC, of, of the, what's the, the home? United Church Homes is with us. Mr. Faust, welcome. Glad you're here. Having said that, the prerogative of the chairman is to take five, and then we will have other business that will be some public safety items presented to us. So take five. The mayor has asked that we include in new business information presentation about a forensics facility uh, directed by our public safety committee and public safety staff. You have to introduce the folks. Thank you. I'm, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not sure if we need to go out of session or not. I think we probably do because I would request the committee go out of session and bring Ms. Denise Martin uh, with us, if that's okay. Spend the rules. So we do hear a motion to spend the rules. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. So it would be Ms. Martin and uh, our EMS director, Brian Gaither. So as 
some of the older members will know and testify, we have had um, for several years a great need in Rutherford County to find a way to deal with uh, the large number of autopsies and how that's typically done currently is we send our autopsies to the forensic center in Davidson County. We send approximately 3,500, excuse me, 350 to 360 autopsies a year. The current cost of doing an autopsy is $2,300 per autopsy to the county. And that particular facility, Mr. Gaither is gonna pass you a handout of the slides presentation. Ms. Martin will give her in just a second. But I'm just kind of, this, this is a kind of a statement of need, but so as the fifth largest county in the state, soon to be the fourth largest county in the state, obviously, um, unfortunately, deaths occur and sometimes these deaths require an autopsy. And so we send them to Nashville, <clears throat> which is what we've been doing since, since day one. And this, the Nashville facility is a quite capable facility. H however, it, is, it serves not just um, Rutherford County, but also serves Davidson County and about 50, 52 other counties. There are currently in Tennessee five regional forensic centers. There's one in Memphis, Nashville, Tri-Cities, Knoxville, and Chattanooga. So we have three regional forensic facilities in the eastern third of the state, and then we have one facility in Middle Tennessee, and we have one facility in West Tennessee. And as you gentlemen and ladies know, Middle Tennessee is the fastest growing region exponentially over any other region of the state, and Rutherford County is the fastest growing county in the state. And so it has put a great burden on Mr. Gaither and Ms. Martin and their staff, and how do we get a reasonable and quick, reliable turnaround on our autopsies? That is just not an issue with Rutherford County, but since this particular regional forensic center in Davidson County, it also serves 53 other counties, they have the same issue. And so this became rather, uh, this came to, we've always known, or Ms. Martin and Ms. Gaither have all, and even Commissioner Phillips and others have known about this issue, but the issue didn't become uh, quite as obvious as it did except during COVID. And literally Rutherford County and Tennessee dodged a bullet with regard to the COVID crisis because the CDC happened to be wrong in their estimates with regard to deaths. And thank goodness they were because if they had been even close to right, we would have literally been overwhelmed. And if you'll recall, this body approved uh, two temporary cooler trucks, trailers, to, to temporary house uh, bodies in. But I can tell you that it was a, that wasn't even an appropriate Band-Aid for the problem that was potentially looming. And so Rutherford County dodged a bullet. The federal government has issued to Tennessee $3.7 billion in grants for various purposes, in part to alleviate what the COVID crisis illustrated on the part of a lot of local communities. And so currently there is within the Governor Lee administration a group called FSAG, and that is the federal, I forgot what, I forgot what it is. Thank you, Denise, uh, been a long day. But anyway, FSAG is Governor Lee's senior administration officials, and what they do, they have exclusive authority and control over how these $3.7 billion of federal money is delivered to the communities uh, in, in part to deal with COVID relief and the potential for another catastrophic event, not just like COVID, but be, for a lot of different, like the East Palestine, Ohio train accident, that's a classic example, or, or an aircraft accident or something like that. So it's just not uh, COVID type relief and autopsies, but it's mass casualties events. And so what Ms. Martin has done is she's put together a presentation she's gonna show you and the reason I'm bringing this before you tonight in what looks to be like a rushed fashion, only because it is, is because that 
I was under the assumption that the FSAG money that was given to Governor Lee to administrate had to go through the Tennessee General Assembly for approval. Indeed, as some of you may know, I spoke to Dr. Brian Terry, our state representative here, and uh, State Senator Shane Reeves, and they pulled caption bill that for funding for a regional forensic center in Smyrna. And so we, they have pulled that caption bill and it was our intention to, that they were gonna then write that bill and then put it on as a budget amendment for approval by the Tennessee General Assembly. Last week, uh, Dr. Martin and I visited uh, Commissioner Alfredo, the health commissioner for Tennessee, and we found out quite by accident in that meeting that Governor Lee and the FSAG group did not have to go to the Tennessee General Assembly for funding. Indeed, that money, those monies for a grant can be delivered exclusively by the Lee administration directly to the county or the recipient without going to the Tennessee General Assembly. Moreover, and more heartening, was that we found out again that they were waiting on our proposal. And <laughs> It's, that's good news, Commissioner Gooch. That is excellent news because it just it just shows you that you know you work really really hard and you think you're doing it right, and somebody says you might want to just put the proposal together because they're waiting on the proposal. So, because Hamilton County and Knox County have already received their grants, uh, they received Hamilton County received ten million dollars, and they were going to match three point. $8 million, thank you, Denise, and then Knox County received a $20 million grant, and th that was going to be matched by Knox County at 8.7. And so what I am asking for this committee to do is send a recommendation to budget so that we can make a grant requ request, but for an unknown match. And I don't know what our match will be, even if we were to do a match, and here's why. Hamilton County has an existing facility they're updating. Knox County has an existing facility that they're trying to move out of because they've outgrown it. We don't have a facility. And so they have assets that they're going to sell and leverage to meet their match. The, our assets are currently that we will donate the land in uh, off Weekly Lane in, in the in Smyrna community. But other than that, I'm Denise and I are gonna try to make the pitch, the idea that our match should legitimately be smaller, but at the same time, they, that may not be the requirement. And so we're asking for, we're asking for approximately a $15 million grant and potentially a $6 million match for a total of $21 million. Now that's, and the reason I can't be more accurate than that is because on, on March 22nd, Denise and I and others will be going to Governor Lee and making this presentation, which you're going to see a portion of in just a second, to the FSAG group. That's on March 22nd. It is our understanding that the potential for a decision that day is real. We understand that when Knox County and Hamilton County made their presentation, the FSAG group made the decision to approve the grant request before they left. So it is our hope that we would get a similar approval process. On March 8th, I've got a meeting with the Finance Commissioner, Jim Bryson. And Jim, Mr. Bryson, who happens to be a friend of mine, he was an associate colleague of mine when I was at TDEC. And so he has, he has granted us an audience to sit and discuss this with him so he can help us navigate this particular part of the grant process. What I'm referring to specifically is the, the match portion. So we can come in on March 22nd knowing that we've done the best we could about what we need to ask for yet still get approval, if that makes sense. So I, I'm asking for a little bit of latitude. I know this is an unusual request and uh, it's not typical. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is make as leverage as much as are possible the state, uh, excuse me, the federal funds available for this grant request. And so uh, I will be glad to take questions after Ms. Martin's presentation, uh, but that's kind of the scenario that we're in. Ms. Martin, if you'll make your presentation. Thank you. Mayor Carr, would you, Rachel, would you read the motion that came out of uh, uh, public safety last night? 
I think that motion was uh, to forward on to this committee and then forward it on to budget and then forward it on to the commission so we could get as much information in commissioners' hands as physically possible before you made your presence. Yes, and I want to. So the con there was a concern in public safety last night that th this might should go to. Um, Property management, boy, it's been a long day. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen, to property and management. And so I spoke to Chairman McAdoo today, and I apprised him of the situation. He said, no, by all means, proceed in the manner that you've outlined so this can be expedited. He said, uh, he said with the understanding and assurance that if the grant is, uh, if we receive the grant, then it obviously would come back to property and management for our discussion at that point in time. So. Uh, We've got to kind of, we, I, I'm trying to do the checkoffs, ladies and gentlemen. So if we can read the resolution, have you found it, Rachel? Oh, okay, so uh, Commissioner, can we go ahead and get started and read the resolution after the presentation? Great, thank you, sir. Denise. Uh, so good evening and thank you so very much for allowing me to speak with you all this evening and my, my sincere apologies to Commissioners Oliver, McMurray and Phillips because they've already heard this presentation so I certainly appreciate their, their patience as well as all the other Commissioners. Um, so my hope tonight is to be able to give you a, a, a good overview of um, where we are now uh, and what our hopes are to do in the future. So the personnel who perform both administrative and investigative support services to our county medical examiner, Dr. Lorraine, Dr. Lorraine McDonald, who's actually in, in the, on the benches this evening, um, include myself as supervisor, two grant-funded medical legal death investigators, as well as the EMS shift supervisors. Uh, the federal government, through a BGA uh, grant, recognized our county's need not only for a de dedicated space to work and train, but a secure and appropriate area for performance of external examinations and toxic toxicology specimen procurement for those cases that did not reach the threshold for autopsy. So we, we do now have a small, and by small I mean 684 square foot small, exam room to fulfill this need. The federal government also through another BGA grant additionally recognized our need as a, a Tennessee Department of Health designated high impact area for substance abuse, drug related deaths uh, and fatalities, uh, that we needed full time dedicated medical legal death investigators on our team. Um, we also um, received that grant in order to establish an opioid fatality review board. Uh, so we were thereby able to, able to hire a, two full-time medical legal death investigators um, to our department. And while we appreciate that these federal government validations of needed improvements to our county's medical legal death investigation system, um, we know that these were only the initial steps. They were the uh, uh, baby steps, essentially, to what this county truly needs. So we implore you as our commissioners uh, to recognize our real need is that we need our own forensic center and medical examiner division. The majority of each day still requires our medical examiner investigation coverage by our EMS shift supervisors. Our EMS crews uh, perform approximately 3,300 runs per month. Um, and we're also performing approximately 170 death investigations every month. So this means that our EMS shift supervisors are performing what should be a full-time death investigator's job during the hours of 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. seven days a week. Uh, and they're performing these duties at the same time that they're performing their invaluable EMS duties and shift uh, supervision. Our county morgue is still graciously being uh, provided by St. Thomas Rutherford Hospital. And our forensic services, as the mayor outlined, are being performed at an out of county uh, facility that's managed by a for-profit company. This facility, as the mayor sa said, at, at does uh, autopsy service for an additional 52 other counties. And autopsy fees have recently increased two times within an 11 month period. Rutherford County, like all other counties served at this particular facility, are constantly jockeying for case priority every day. As with all the five RFCs in Tennessee, the Middle Tennessee Regional Forensic Center is home to the medical examiner uh, office in which it is located. So our facility that we send our cases to is actually the, the Metro Nashville Davidson County Medical Examiner's Office, which as you can imagine is an extremely busy office. 
So serving 52 counties, which is over 50% of the state, involves an extremely, uh, extremely high daily caseload. And it's a well-known fact, unfortunately, that the more cases examined on a, on a daily basis, the higher the potential risk for mistakes to be made. So looking at our death and autopsy statistics, the total number of deaths pronounced in our county has continued to significantly increase, but this has been in line with our continued population increases, which have been exponential. The number of autopsies that are performed have, have increased annually in a very similar but expected manner. Of note are the years 2020 and 2021, the height of the recent COVID pandemic, and the excess deaths that you can see on that slide are not solely due to COVID infections. A state and national research has determined that many of these excess deaths are due to un unanticipated side effects and unanticipated uh, victims of the pandemic. Those um, are from a devastating impact that the pandemic itself and the restrictions that we, we were all under, um, they had a devastating impact on those experiencing uh, mental health disorders and conditions and substance abuse disorders. Here in Rutherford County, we noted a 33% increase in substance abuse drug-related deaths from 2019 to 2020, um, which is similar to what has been seen across the state and nation. Um, please keep in mind that while COVID and other infectious disease processes are tracked by the medical examiner's office, uh, but they don't routinely require um, autopsy performance, whereas drug-related and suicide deaths do. Uh, devastatingly, these numbers continued through 2021, uh, so which goes to explain why uh, autopsy numbers increased in tandem with the total number of deaths for those particular years, which were the height of the pandemic, but they were well beyond what was anticipated due to increases in population. As the mayor mentioned, we did do dodge a bullet with the pandemic. We fortunately did not see the full surge in deaths that was predicted by the CDC, and we did prepare ourselves as well as uh, we could with the resources we had at hand. Um, we did on numerous occasions um, assist St. Thomas Rutherford with storage of decedents' remains during that pandemic period, however. But one thing to really keep in mind with this pandemic was that it was a slow-moving mass fatality event. If we were to have an immediate need to respond to a, a true mass fatality incident, uh, such as a commercial plane crash, a bus crash, um, some cat catastrophic event at one of our manufacturing plants, or God forbid, a mass shooting, we would not be so prepared. We do not have permanent surge capacity storage that could cope with a mass fatality. The Nashville facility does not have space to assist. Um, this is evidenced by their continued use of TEMA provided refrigerated trailers that were originally and only intended to be used, uh, used in the COVID pandemic surge of, of excess bodies, um, but they are still currently using them today. Uh, but they are using them for storage of excess bodies associated with their high daily caseload. And something rather graphic to keep in mind is that there are, these include bodies of, of loved ones of our Ruther Rutherford County residents. <coughs> Davidson County, our autopsy vendor, would not be able to cope with a mass fatality event in its own jurisdiction. They certainly can't help one of the counties that they're servicing that's outside of their jurisdiction. Another thing to note with the pandemic was at the start um, of the pandemic, the Middle Tennessee Re Regional Center required us to hold cases, store the decedent's remains, until we could perform a PCR COVID test, which back then was taken at least three days, and then show proof of that negative result. And rather, a county, just like a majority of the Tennessee counties that don't have a, a true county morgue or a facility, this caused a significant issue back then. As, as, the, as the mayor discussed, this is not a new idea. Um, we've certain people in our audience today, um, you know, Carl Hudgens, our former EMS director, has been championing this for, for a, at least a decade and a half. But the pandemic really pushed this to an immediate and, and, a, and a today need. So looking at this rather graphic map, um, you can see that there is a large number of counties that are using one vendor for their autopsy service. And I keep mentioning that the number of you know, 52, 53 counties, um, but I think this map demonstrates it well. 
and something to think about. If all 52 service counties ordered an autopsy on the same day, this would be equivalent to a mass fatality event for that regional forensic center. We have seen on a regular basis that cases are hold, held over one, two, or even up to four days on some occasions before the forensic examination is performed due to that high daily caseload. I'm sure you can imagine what the impact on this has on families awaiting release of their loved ones' remains, um, the condition of the remains itself, um, as well as the associated evidence, our funeral homes needing to arrange those final disp disposition, as well as the investigating agencies urgently needing those preliminary results in order to move forward with their investigations or close out their cases. By Tennessee statute, forensic autopsies are required to be performed at an accredited regional forensic center, uh, and as we've mentioned, there are only five. Therefore, our only other option at this time would be to send cases to Memphis, Knoxville, or Johnson City. Um, Chattanooga currently only provides services to their own county. Logistically, this would be unfeasible, uh, both in cost and time to the medical examiner uh, office and law enforcement agencies, notwithstanding the unacceptable impact on the decedent's families. Regardless, the other RFCs are not looking to expand their service area due to each being at capacity currently. Thus, we are truly beholden to the Nashville facility. Our own data access is restricted by the managing company's proprietary and commercial case management system. Communication has become limited, not only towards our office, but to the other investigating agencies as well. Um, I should add that I do not this, believe this is a reflection on the quality um, of, the, of the personnel at the RFC, but truly a reflection on just how busy they are on a daily basis. Um, however, this does all negatively affect our investigations. Um, it affects how law enforcement are able to attend the, uh, the examination when notification by the RFC is, is delayed um, or even overlooked on occasion. Time management of personnel and planning of schedules are affected, as well as the information needed uh, for, for uh, provision of real-time uh, real public health, health and safety alerts. We truly believe that a Rutherford County Forensic Center would address and alleviate the problems identified, in addition to improving access and timeliness of results. So moving on to the cost to the county. We certainly appreciate that one of the Commission's duties is to ensure that all departments and county services are being provided in a fiscally responsible manner. This graphic um, it displays what we have been paying for autopsy services from 2017 to present, as well as a projection for 2023. As you will no doubt anticipate, overall costs have increased in line with population and death number increases, and ultimately those autopsy number increases as a, as a result. However, I believe it's imperative to point out that the county was presented with two unexpected uh, but significant fee increases by the managing company of the forensic facility. One became effective March 2022 for an increase of $275 per autopsy, which moved it from $1825 per autopsy to $2100. And then we had another, another that became effective in February of this year, so just this just past, uh, past month. And that increased it from another, uh, for another $200. So uh, we went from $2100 to currently what we will be paying is $2300 per autopsy. Both these increases were advised with only a few months' notice, both in the middle of our fiscal year budgets and within 11 months. In fact, we've had three increases since 2020. So with less than three years, we've had a total increase uh, of 33%. While increases on the basis of inflation of cost of living um, and uh, inflation certainly can be anticipated, it is not believed that these are the only factors in play. Uh, the other RFCs have not followed suit and have not increased um, their fees uh, to this extent. It is strongly indicated that our vendors' uh, fee heights can be attributed to other issues, probably more related being a for-profit company with branches in other states and still looking to expand. So while 2023 projected numbers, autopsy numbers, have returned closer to pre-pandemic rates, they are still anticipated to increase in line with those continued population increases. 
However, due to the two latest fee increases, it is anticipated that we'll incur a higher cost for autopsy service this year than we even did at the, at the very height of the pandemic. In fact, autopsy costs are anticipated to easily exceed 800,000 in 2023. So we do have a real potential to create a flagship forensic center. Uh, Rutherford County um, has always been involved in community service and uh, this center would not um, um, be, uh, it'd be remiss if we weren't thinking in the same way. Uh, we have the opportunity, a true opportunity to provide not only improvements with uh, quality and timeliness of medical legal death investigation, which is a priority, but for partnerships with the largest Tennessee university, which also happens to be located in our county. MTS, MTSU's Forensic Institute for Research and Education has made it very clear that they would jump at the opportunity to collaborate on training, education, and research at a forensic facility in Rutherford County. This would not only provide MTSU students, but other involved agencies and personnel, both on the local level, uh, regional, state, and national. And joint instru instruction can reach a multitude of different disciplines, from forensic anthropology, nursing, criminal justice, and public health, to name but a few. We are also hopeful that with the, recently, uh, the relatively recent collaboration or agreement with MTSU and Meharry Medical College, that an education training and practical experience program could also be developed for medical students interested in, particularly in the field of forensic pathology. Not only would this collaboration impact a recognized gap in training and education, it would provide for a needed hiring pool of candidates with real experience in forensics as they graduate. There is a true dire shortage of trained medical legal death investigators and board certified forensic pathologists in this country. The Tennessee State Medical Examiner has also vo voiced her interest in collaborating with and potentially sharing space at the proposed center. Uh, this would be obviously a benefit to rather the county in that we would have direct access to the state medical examiner's office as, as well as on-site provision of in-service training for both medical examiner and law enforcement personnel. Both the above provide not only community service benefits but also could help Rutherford County to offset ongoing operational costs of running the RFC. Collaboration with MTSU has the potential for sharing of revenue for outside training events and courses, and sharing a space with the OSCME, the State Medical Examiner's Office, would, um, could involve sharing of utilities. There are other potential offsets, um, including sizable federal grants that are available to medical examiner offices who partner with institutions of higher education to include universities and medical colleges. So in summary, yes, I'm getting to the summary, um, it is very apparent that Middle Tennessee needs an additional RFC. The only one is currently providing service to over 50% of our state, and Rutherford County truly deserves a better option to trust our medical legal autopsy service to. There is a dire need for surge capacity storage and a mass fatality response center with priority for our county, uh, but also to our region. The number of the RFCs has not changed for over 20 years, despite exponential population growth. An additional RFC is needed to appropriately attend to the current need for forensic autopsy service in our county, but also the region and state. Rutherford County, as well as other Middle Tennessee and even West Tennessee counties, need a long-term, sustainable, cost-effective means of providing medical legal autopsy service for our rapidly growing population. Rutherford County EMS and Medical Examiner's Office, along with the County Mayor's Office, truly implores their committee to support this product, project. There truly in, exists a dire need for better control of forensic services provided to Rutherford County, and we have an opportunity to request and a real potential for receiving state assistance in funding at this facility at this time. But as the Mayor mentioned, uh, time is truly of the essence um, for this request. Federal state stimulus funds are limited um, at this point and will be expended probably over this next month. We will not see this level of funding again unless, God forbid, there is another pandemic in our lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. I would like to add a couple of things. Uh, first of all, um, this need has been apparent, as she said, for 15 years or more. 
And so there's been discussions in our community and even among this body about how we could go about funding a need such as this, and it's just been, it's been difficult historically. We got to this place uh, because we have one person in particular who had great vision. And any good idea becomes a great idea because it takes a per, per, one individual who's willing to step out and have vision. And I think that it would be, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Carl Hudgens, who's with us this evening, who had that vision. He had that vision years ago, uh, long before I even knew that there was a need for a forensic center. And so it takes people like Mr. Hudgens, who was the former EMS director, to state that out. And then we're also very, very fortunate to have Ms. Martin, who can execute and to give us the deliverables on that vision. And one thing that is, that is, that, that is unique about our presentation is, would be our relationship with MTSU and Meharry Medical, number one. But number two, the f location of the facility in Smyrna is within a mile of the Smyrna Airport, which gives us tremendous leverage with regard to a catastrophic event, which no other facility in Tennessee can, can supply. And so we are have a unique opportunity, both in timing and in funding, but also uh, in location. And so with that, I'm going to ask per Commissioner Phillips's request to read uh, the resolution. Do you have that, Rachel? The motion from last night's public uh, safety meeting reads as Commissioner James moved, seconded by Commissioner Beverly, with the intent to apply for FSAG funding for a regional forensic center in Rutherford County and forward to the Health and Education Committee and the Budget Committee. This motion passed unanimously by a roll call vote. With that, um, we would glad to take questions, Mr. Chairman, if it's appropriate. Do we need to go back in session to, to ask questions? I, I would love for these folks to be able to stay with us. Can anybody direct me there? I would, I would prefer there may be some questions that Ms. Martin is unique. Stay out of session. I, so I would think you, that okay. would be appropriate. So we're going to. We're going to stay out of session, but I'm going to open the floor for questions directed towards our professionals. Michael? I just want to clarify something for, for this body. Um, it came up a little bit last night. Um, this is this is kind of routine for us with grants to not know the match, especially with federal money. And so what, what this intent to apply means is that it's an intent to apply and figure out what that match is, whether it's zero, 20% or 40%. We don't know yet. so. Once we were to be awarded, it would come back through the committee process before anything is spent or before there's any contract signed, before there's any authorization, it would come back. I, I just want to clarify that. Um, I know the mayor needs some flexibility as far as when we, when we meet with the governor's staff or, or with his office or with the state. Um, I think what the mayor's looking for is a commitment, hey, we want to do this um, so that that way when we get down there, um, we don't come back and go, oh, we changed our mind. Um, but that's, this is very normal through the to use federal funds for us to do an intent to apply and then come back uh, through the committee process to actually talk about those figures and appropriate funding. So keep in mind that this is not a request for the funds, but if you say yes, you're probably committing to somewhere around a $6 million match, which is 40% of the potential grant, which is in keeping with the other two counties that were mentioned tonight. So don't be frivolous with your yes vote because it's hard to pull back in government. So if you're pursuing a $10 million grant, you're gonna be looking at a $6 million contribution on top of the other items that we are struggling with, particularly in our budget. Mr. Chairman, discussion. the motion that came out of uh, public safety last night was the intent to apply motion. Agreed. And that motion has been forwarded on to this committee and asking that this committee approve the same motion and forward it on to budget. And, and we will, if, if we go back in session, we'll allow someone to, to make that, that motion, but we're still out of session. So we'll, we'll if so, if you have questions for our professionals, uh, Ms. Martin and Mr. Gaither, 
go ahead and ask those. Yeah, Commissioner Davidson. Okay, so we're Feel free to going... take the mic, you guys. Feel free to front and center if you want to. Um, so when we're talking about the money aspect, how the, it keeps going up and up and up, um, how will that change having our own facility? Great question, because what we're talking about is currently at today's, we're talking 350 to 360 autopsies at the current $2,300 per autopsy. So we'll pull that money back internally. So that's about $800,000 plus or minus. Additionally, this, and we didn't, we didn't speak to this, but that's very important. Additionally, this facility is not just going to be designed and engineered for Rutherford County. Part of what we're trying to do is relieve some of the stress and overcrowding and overburden that's in Davidson County. So it's our intent to make this facility service up to a population of almost one million. Okay, in doing so now, where's that come from? It comes from surrounding counties. In particular, the Department of Health seems saying, can, can you help us with relief and pressure in the western part of the state, out, out I-40 West? And that's real easy for us to do because of its location, because it sits right at the nexus of 24 and 840. So from a time, from a time transport perspective that works out quite well and if you go back and look at the map you can see you've got Lake County which is in the northwest part of the state bringing their uh, doing their autopsies in Nashville so we're going to relieve quite a bit of that pressure so uh, we're going to this we're going to do our best to make this revenue neutral back to Rutherford County but I am not going to make that promise any more than the current ability to move or do our autopsies is revenue neutral. But we should be able to defray some of the reoccurring costs associated with this facility in that regard. Also, we'll have the state medical, it's our intent to have the state medical examiner located in this facility. So we would also, that would also be a potential point of revenue as well. So there, there, we're trying to develop some revenue points to offset the cost of this facility to the county. But at the end of the day, this is greatly needed because of the stress point we all experienced in during the COVID crisis. And that's, that's the point we're trying to make. Just a couple of questions out of curiosity that I didn't ask last night. Um, does St. Thomas charge us for use of their morgue and how much is that? Denise. No, they currently do not. Uh, they've been graciously providing it. Um, but, you know, during the pandemic, as I mentioned in the presentation, there has been certain times, particularly during the pandemic, when we have had to give them some relief. Uh, because obviously, with a very busy hospital, um, their hopes to transition to a level two, uh, with those additional trauma cases, and unfortunately, with those types of cases, the, the numbers of deaths that that hospital is unfortunately going to be experienced. So they're using that morgue uh, for, for their own patients um, that unfortunately pass, as well as our cases. So it's going to get to a sticky point of, it's not just uh, that they're providing that currently free, but at some point they're gonna have to say, we just can't house them anymore. They don't have a footprint that they can expand. And currently they only have space for about 12 to 15 bodies. And is there a reason why Chattanooga only services their own county? <laughs> Say that in the presentation. Well, their facility, um, which is why they've, they've been um, um, successful in their grant request, is a very small facility. Um, it's very antiquated. Uh, so without a doubt, there was a need there. Uh, so they were unable to take, based on the size of the facility and the, unfortunately, the uh, limitations of that building, they were, un they were unable to, to assist in any other manner. Um, I don't believe, uh, they are gonna certainly take on other cases. I think that's part of the agreement with the state with them. I don't really wanna speak on their behalf, um, but it's only gonna be in those East Tennessee counties. It will not affect that, uh, that big pink section up there um, because uh, they are not looking to really relieve the Middle Tennessee area. They're still looking at those East Tennessee counties. If I could build on that question, did, did Hamilton County's grant request was it I don't, less grandiose than ours? They were not projecting the possibility of grand collaborations or 
So I think they kept their grant smaller and their contribution therefore less and committed to only serve their needs, which could we, could we revert to if, if this passed and it got awarded or, or we, we were in the running and it came back to budget, could we as a body choose to bring it down and still get the grant so, or? So if I may, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I, I, I want to make sure, I, what, right, and I want to make sure we have our facts correct. Part of the stipulation for Hamilton County receiving their grant was that they would, they're going to expand the size of their facility. So they're going to service, not, they're going to service six counties now, up to six counties, not just their county. So this is a current map. This isn't the I projected map. Commissioner Oliver and I misunderstood that. that so. That's fine. And, that, and that's fine. And so what we're saying is when we are overlaid on this map, we're looking at 10 to 12 additional counties. And so you can see what Knoxville's doing. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to relieve some of the pressure uh, that's in Middle Tennessee. Chattanooga is going to release some of the pressure with six counties, and that's just not illustrated on this map. Commissioner Wilson. Thank you, Chairman. Well, and, and on what you just said, 52 minus six is still a pretty big number of counties. It's still a real big number. Um, actually, numbers, I know how much you love numbers, Mayor. So, you know, that's one right there. That was a good point. I have a couple of others. You mentioned $800,000 is an annual autopsy. Yes, sir. And so, I, I, Mr. Um, Smith has corrected me once again this evening. It's the actual 22-23 budget is $735,000 for autopsies. But we do expect it to be 800 or more in the next budget year. The other thing we have to take into account, sorry for my interruption, um, is that we have to tra pay for transport to take these uh, decedents remains to Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, uh, is something that we have to in, in, in budget for as well. With having our own facility, um, we, won't, we won't be incurring such a high cost in those transport charges. So I'm trying to put some application numbers in my mind. So I've got the 52 minus 6, 800,000. So we're, we're going to, in a number of years, catch up to spending this money one way or another. Can I say that the opportunity right now is we're going to spend this money within 8 to 10 years regardless, but this is a once, I think you said once in a known while at the moment, to get the assistance from the state. Because yeah. right now we're talking about eight hundred thousand dollars a year, but we're going to catch up to our our matching funds within a few years. If we wait, we're funding this whole thing down the road. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't think I need and, to say and, it. And I, and I would and I would and I would also remind, quite honestly, some of the grants best available to locals are grants, are health grants, or grants like this. Now I'm not. I, we're not factoring any of that into these cost equations. But as this committee knows, there are a number of grants that come through the commission that we apply and get approved for that have to do with federal and state funding to support these kinds of services. We're not going to factor those into the ROI because we don't know what those are at this time. But we can ex reasonably expect there would be something available in, as the years come and th as this continues to develop. Sure, and I know you mentioned we can't promise revenue neutral by taking other counties, but just the amount of money we're spending now, we're going to catch up to that within a few years. So we're paying this money within eight to ten years one way or another, but this way we're saving transport time. Um, God help us if there is a significant event in which it's a good thing we were able to help out the Davidson County one to be able to take care of Well, not to scare anybody, but if we'd had the train accident down there at Singer Road, or in Christiana that they had in East Palestine, Ohio. I mean, we were we are we are completely unprepared, and so yeah, we hope for the best, but we're required to prepare for the worst in some respects. And there's this is an opportunity to do this, uh, so that we don't have to pay, bear the whole cost. Well, I know my decision is based on the fact that I'm being told it's an as presented, it's an opportunity that if we let pass. To do this again in the future, we're looking at funding the whole thing versus having the state assistance. That's correct. Okay. I, I, I need to get us back in session. That's that's getting into deliberation. Um, so, without objection, I'm going to call us back into session. And if we if we need professional guidance, we'll invite you guys back up. So, please, yes, absolutely. Let's ask it in session. I think that's appropriate. Yes. Uh, on the on the map, uh, who decides what county goes where? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's the county decision. Uh, there is okay. no 
the only requirement statutorily is that we send our forensic cases to an accredited facility. Uh, so we could send our cases to Memphis, but obviously right. logistically wise and hardship wise on the families, that would be too far to go, as well as to our law enforcement. So we're not required to go there. The other, the other RFCs have essentially capped themselves. They're saying this is a, you know, the capacity that we can comfortably and give a quality service to. So Knox County are, are, are providing service for 21 counties. They do not want to take on any more because the capacity. The, the capacity is just too much. Uh, so same with Memphis and, and, and uh, East Tennessee and Hamilton County. They know how many they can um, provide quality service to without um, providing any other detriment. So essentially the Middle Tennessee has not capped themselves and have continued to expand. And did we, did I hear or understand, and this may be for the mayor, that if we get what we're asking for, that we would be able to take on how many counties? 12? Did I? T 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Okay, so that leads me to the next question. So, because we're, we're an upstart compared to the other centers, is 15 million low number or? So, how, how, so where do we come up with that number? Right. So, the, we it's it's these numbers are reverse engineered. So we understand based on the size of the population, the size of the facility. The size of the facility is approximately 20,000 square feet. It'll be a two-story building. Based on that, we know it's about $600 or plus or minus more per square foot. That's not counting FF&E. And so that takes us, and that's not counting site work. So that takes us to, to about the 20, $21 million number. We're, we're, I'm hoping to do better than 15 to six. I really am. I think I'm optimistic, but I'm not gonna make a pledge or a promise where the metrics we're using for the numbers of 15 and 6, 15 from the grant and 6 match is based on the metrics that were that Hamilton County and Knox County were provided. But I think we can make a better argument for that because we're an upstart. We're at Smyrna, which is a mile from the airport. We're going to enter into a relationship with Meharry and MTSU for a medical facility, and we're going to house the state medical examiner. So we have things to offer that the other facilities do not. So we're hoping that provides us the leverage for a better match equation than 15-6. And in my understanding that Nashville is the only one of the centers that's for profit? That's correct. And the other ones are government? They're, they would be operated like, like we are, yes, sir. Lo by local, they're operated by lo the local county government. Would you, so when we make our presentation, is there any possibility that the state could come back and say, okay, we're going to do this, but could we do enough that you could take on 20 counties? If we decide how many counties we can take on. Th that is, on this. and so excellent question, because not it's just not that Commissioner, Commissioner Gooch, that I, not just that question I want to get answered, Commissioner Gooch, by Commissioner Bryson. Literally, when I go see Commissioner Bryson on the 8th, he's going to somewhat manage because he's a part of this FSAG group. He knows what they're looking at. And the health commissioner has also been very, very helpful. So I'm, we're going to get that expectation managed. We'll know on March 10th what that's going to look like. Does that make sense? Yes. So is, they, they most certainly fluid. could say they this, could. This is very fluid and very it could change. Fluid. They could, they could come back and say, well, we, don't want you, we, want, we only want to fund a facility that where it's you in six other counties. Or we could say, we want you in 20 other counties. I don't know. We have heard that we're going to plan for 10 to 12 counties is what we've heard, right? So that is our initial, going to be our initial proposal. But they will absolutely come back and because during this presentation, we really don't make a presentation. The reason March 10th is so important is we've got to send to the FSAG group our presentation. They have the presentation for 12 days. We go up there and literally all we do is answer questions for about 30 minutes to an hour on the presentation. They're already well versed in the presentation. They don't need the presentation. They've got additional questions they want answers to and it's probably questions like that if I were to guess. Well, if we need a motion, Mr. Chair, to send this to budget, I'll, I'll go ahead and make that motion. And do we have a second? Second. M Molly, so it uh, was unanimous in, pub in uh, public safety, correct? And we have two members on public safety, and obviously y'all voted yes. 
Did you second this? Okay, okay. I, I just needed to confirm that. That, uh, uh, that kind of support helps me kind of cross over some of these really big decisions that are kind of scary. So having said that, any more discussion? Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Oliver? Aye. Commissioner Davidson? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Boyd? Yes. Commissioner McMurray? Yes. Commissioner Gooch? Yes. Chairman Dodd? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you for that thorough yes, bit of information. Thank you. Vice Chair, is there anything else on our agenda that we need to cover that you're aware of? I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. All in favor, aye. Let's go. I need you to sign this to go to budget. Thanks, everybody.